Thank you, Senator Kapa, for those wonderful words. You did make me a little sad and a little somber when you talked about the Japanese internment. I think someday we will have to do something about it to build a memorial, maybe a Japan-sized park that will protect the environment and remind us that we, we should never do again what we did that. Uh, it would be great if Muslims could help build a park like that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Congressman John Carney. Uh, we had an interesting ex attempt to, 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 to get this coordinated, and finally, when we did get to talk, we had a very interesting conversation about uh, Congressman Carney's vision on especially uh, police uh, society relations, and I hope he will talk about it today, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. So without much ado, Congressman Carney. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khan, for inviting me and all of you for coming today. Special thanks to the students. Uh, I think uh, the governor said they were from St. Andrews. I don't know if there are other students out there, but taking this amount of time on a Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon when you're a student speaks uh, well of, of each of you and the teachers and adults that are, that are here with you. I spend a lot of time at different events with our, our two senators, Senator Carper and Senator Coons, and the governor don't get as much time to, to, uh, to spend with uh, members of the General Assembly, uh, but it's good to be with, uh, with you too as, as well today. Last night we were at an event for a guy by the name of Fred Sears. And Fred is a, one of those really good guys that, that does so much and has done so much for our community over 30 or 40 years, both in business, in philanthropy, uh, as an elected official and as an advisor to elected officials. And the governor presented him last night with the Order of the First State, which is the highest award that the governor can confer on anyone, and nobody deserves it more than Fred. And in, in talking about Fred and presenting the award, the governor said, you know, most of all, Fred has been a, a, an open ear for all elected officials and somebody that we all go to for advice uh, before our elections. And I was sitting in the back thinking, I wish Fred had given me the same advice that he gave him when, when we ran against each other back in 2008. <laughs> but it's good, it's good to be here uh, with my friends, and we work together hard on, on so many issues. Dr. Conan and I did have a back and forth on, on how I would fit into the agenda today, and initially I thought I would be here for the, the, the break, and maybe I was really interested in talking about law enforcement because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot we work together with uh, the delegation, the governor, uh, Mayor Williams of the city of Wilmington to address what I think is one of the biggest and most difficult challenges facing our state. And that, that is the drugs and violence and killing in, in the city of Wilmington. Wilmington clearly is the economic and commercial center of our state. I've lived there for 30 years. I've been troubled to see the development. I've worked with kids for a big part of that that time, and I've seen kids grow up alongside my own two sons, some of which have been able to get, find their way out of really terrible family and neighborhood situations, and some of, of which have been sucked down into the violence uh, and ended up in jail and other places. This week, if you paid any attention to the media, you've seen the trials uh, that are going on in, in Maryland right now. Uh, in the, for the first of the F Freddie Gray trials, and here in Delaware we have the trial of the Dover police officer with respect to the encounter with La Latif Dickerson. Neither of those incidents, and many, many more like them, are helpful in, in the challenge that we face in addressing crime and violence in our cities, and, and, it, and it is a, a problem in just about every city, large and small, across our country. I think about it a lot. I have a lot of time to think about it. Uh, as you may know, the delegation spends a lot of time on the train to Washington back and forth. It's about two hours each way. That's four hours a day which is a lot of time to think about a problem that, that, that seems intractable and challenges us at every level. And I would just like to talk today briefly, because this is about social justice, about a really difficult part of that challenge. 
after the Michael Brown incident in Ferguson, Missouri, there was an interview on CNN with the former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. And I was watching that, I don't remember exactly where I was, but I was watching that interview. And essentially what Mayor Giuliani said was that we have a problem of criminality in those communities. And then he went on and the interview went on and on. And after that, one of my colleagues, a guy by the name of Emmanuel Cleaver, was interviewed on the same program. And he, was, he came right after Mayor Giuliani. And the interviewer asked him the exact same question. And he said, you heard Mayor Giuliani. He said, this is really a problem of criminality in those neighborhoods. And Emmanuel, who's both a reverend and a former mayor of Kansas City and one of the most thoughtful members of the U.S. House of Representatives, said this. And the interview, by the way, the context was the whole Michael Brown kind of police use, overuse of force and, and all of that. Giuliani had been dismissive of that and said it was a different kind of problem. What Emmanuel said was, we have two problems. We have a problem of crime in these poor minority communities, and we have a problem with the way police respond to that crime and try to stop it. And we have to solve both problems at the same time. It's not an either or proposition. So if you think about how New York, under Mayor Giuliani, addressed that problem, it was essentially, and I'm oversimplifying it, which I really hesitate to do, because I know what that can do to the decisions that those of us who have to make choices in public life, what it does in communicating the decisions that we make to the public. But essentially, he decided we're going to target these neighborhoods, neighborhoods, communities, saturated policing, stop and frisk, anybody that's in the geographic area. What we, what we have learned, I think, over the years is that doesn't work. It works from time to time, but what does it do? It poisons the relationships with all the good people in those communities. Think about the CDC study that was just completed on crime and violence in the city of Wilmington. It essentially said that <clears throat> this problem was the result of a very small portion of the population, mostly African American males out of, of a certain age group, very small, that went through a life trajectory that was horrendous failure in school, all kinds of particular measures. And at the same time, the vast majority of the people in those communities are good, law-abiding people who are struggling to make ends meet. And so when your law enforcement strategy is to target a community, everybody gets caught up in the net. The better way to do it is a way that I think we're trying to do it here in Wilmington with the leadership of a federal task force, if you will. Senator Coons was very instrumental in, in getting federal resources to address this problem, to be more targeted in addressing the individuals that are the perpetrators of this crime and violence. And it's called predictive policing. And in some ways, it's an outgrowth of our ability using computers to crunch a whole lot of variables to identify higher risk populations. That's a better way to do it, but think about what I just said. You're using certain criteria to identify and target certain individuals. It's kind of the only way you have to do it. But it does mean that from time to time, you're going to get it wrong. It's not going to be perfect. 
And it has all kinds of implications about our constitutional guarantees with respect to search and seizure, with respect, with respect to innocent until proven guilty, and all the implications that that brings in terms of police and law enforcement relationships with the community. We had a, a young man who was shot and killed in a, in a wheelchair in the city of Wilmington, which again is being investigated by federal authorities. There'll be a, a trial and all of that. Nothing really worse can happen when you're trying to address real problems of safety and security and crime in communities that's something like that. Because you start from the position where there's not very good relationships between the police and the communities in the first place. And then you overlay something that reinforces people's perception about law enforcement not valuing the human beings in those communities. Why do I bring this up today? Because there's been a lot of discussion over the last several weeks and where I go to work every day about global terrorism, and there will continue to be for days and weeks and months ahead. And we've talked about it in the earlier session. And the challenge for us and for the country is, how do you fight terrorism and protect the security of all of us, everybody in this room, everybody in this state and in our country, without violating the rights of, of all citizens and people who are here in our country. How do you do that? You certainly don't do it by targeting a neighborhood, targeting a religion, targeting a group of people. The only way you can do it is by trying to identify the real perpetrators and to, th to think that that's easy, I can tell you, and I imagine Senator Carper with the work that he does on Homeland Security will tell you that it is not. Since I arrived in Congress in 2011, we've been debating back and forth the collection of data, all of our data, phone call data and, and internet data and all that. How much we should collect, whether the government should collect it, who gets to look at it, under what conditions, and on and on and on. One of the great things about this country is that those rights are guaranteed and that we have those debates all the time, constantly, back and forth, trying to strike that balance between liberty and security. And that's partly where a conference like this and all of you come in. Because we can't make those very difficult decisions with a lot of simplistic rhetoric. There, there's been a lot of discussion about the presidential campaign, which I don't pay, I can't pay much attention to it anyway anymore, to be honest with you because of the way groups are targeted and because of the simplistic way that people are trying to touch nerves that exist out there among the constituents and the people that we, that we represent. These challenges are hard. And it needs all of us, all of you here at a conference like this, talking about the issues, having the panels, inviting your interactions with those of us who have to make those decisions, and having the dialogue that if you were here for the last panel is so important for creating the kind of comfort that's necessary so that people can live free and secure. Let me end by thanking the the organizers of the conference 
and thanking all of you for engaging on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to serve as your only representative in the House. I can guarantee you I go there every day with the intention of doing the right thing for the people that I represent. Thank you very much and God bless you all.